Okay, good afternoon everybody. I'm Ingrid Dennis. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Groundwater Mobile App presentation this afternoon. Um, please just remember to include your, um, or type in your name and your um, affiliation in the chat box so that we can keep record of it and give you your CPD credits. Um, questions as well, use a chat box. Whenever you think of something, just um, drop us a line there. And then please, as usual, keep the mics and the cameras off. Um, or muted, sorry. Um, I, today, I'm going to introduce my husband, um, René Dennis. Um, he works with me at the Centre for Water Sciences and Management, the Northwest University. Um, and he's going to be doing the um, talk this afternoon. Um, he developed the mobile app for the WRC, and we'd also like to acknowledge him in it. So over to you, Rene. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us uh, for this talk. I see a, a lot of uh, familiar people on the on the chat, so um, hopefully there will be some exciting discussions afterwards. Um, what? I'll just get my presentation going. Um, what we'll be discussing today is a mobile app that was initially designed for borehole hydro sensors. Um, it has evolved somewhat uh, since the start of it, um, and I'll discuss that a little bit later on. So, um, just in a nutshell, the presentation outline, um, first just going to set the scene, uh, looking at some uh, stats on the NGA and the GRIP for databases. Um, just a brief uh, uh, talk on uh, mobile GIS um, and then the development environment that we chose for this development. Um, looking at borehole locality change, and, and that will be the focus of, of this chat this afternoon. Um, and how we intend to engage citizen science to help us uh, resolve that locality challenge. And then I'll show you, as you can see, we're on prototype number three, um, just a case study um, here in Potchefstroom, uh, what we achieved with prototype one, what prototype two looked like, which was called my borehole. Um, and then just a quick word on what three words, I'll explain when I get there, and then I'll uh, just do a, a live demonstration um, on the mobile app, um, just the, the locality functionality of it. All right, so when we started with this, um, I, I came across this uh, quote to say, software will disrupt most traditional industries in the next five to 10 years. Take Uber as an example, Uber is just a software tool. They don't own any cars and they're now the biggest taxi company in the world. If it doesn't work on your phone, forget the idea. Um, and I think this is partly what sparked this idea to say, but um, let's move over to our mobile platforms. Um, we're all sitting with uh, smart telephones these days with, with excellent capabilities. Um, I'm sure those of you that's got kids, especially those that's a bit older. My kids are on their phones most of the time. So this is a, it's a tool that we can use and engage um, for the benefit of our work as well. Okay, so just a, a brief picture. Um, I hope you can see my pointer um, on the situation today. I'm gonna to start here in the center with the NGA, that's the National Groundwater Archive. Um, just for the sake of clarity, when I refer to an arrow, you'll see some of the arrows are only partially filled, um, where others are solid filled. So partially filled means only partial um, communication that takes place. So the NGA is supposed to be, in a, and to a large extent, is our National Groundwater Archive. We do know, however, that, and that's the box that's sitting there, there's some backlog that still needs to be captured in the NGA. So um, they've got an online interface and we can query the NGA for certain data. And you'll see this is my first partial arrow. Um, the one thing that you don't receive from the web interface is the chemistry data for your area of interest. So that results in an email that gets into you a bit later. 
um, our experience during this project, um, since we queried the NGA for the whole country, um, we didn't really receive any chemistry data. So we had to rely on a snapshot of the 2008 data. So what happens with the data flow from there, we as users download it. Um, we might be using it in research, we might be using it in consulting, um, we're refining that data, adding data to it, and we're quite keen to upload it back into our own databases. And so these are typical institutional databases, um, and they're sitting with consultants, universities, governments. Um, and then we see there's not uh, a lot of uh, upload taking place back to the NGA. And, and this is for various reasons. Um, I suppose one of these reasons is um, the money. Um, we tend to think if we have got a good data set of a specific area, um, we've got the advantage over our competition when it comes to tenders. Um, we don't have to go and collect as much detailed data. Um, one of the other factors, and I suppose I'm guilty there myself, if it takes me time, um, to reformat my data, to upload into a different system, um, uh, I'm, I'm not doing it, and, and where we actually uh, should be doing this. So that's that, that first section of, of data flow. Then we've got the GRIP, and when I refer to the GRIP database, I basically refer to the GRIP Limpopo database. Um, compared to the NGA, this is a very good database. Um, this was funded a couple of years by the Department of Water and Sanitation term contracts. And um, there is supposed to be upload uh, from GRIP to the NGA. Um, so that does take place or did take place in, in, in the past. Um, but when you talk to the guys in the Limpopo province, they are not keen to mix their data with that of the NGA because they um, believe the data to be of, of, of better quality um, which is maybe not always the case of the, of the NGA. Um, and again, looking at the solid green arrow, um, all the data from GRIP is freely available. Um, and there's, it's not a problem actually getting that data. And in actual fact, it's, it's easier getting a, a dump of that whole database um, as opposed to that of the National Grant Auto Archive. Okay, so what does this, these databases look like? Um, I've got a snapshot over here, and you'll see the colors eventually just flow into each other um, because of the number of boreholes. So this snapshot was taken at the end of 2019. So we can see from the National Ground Water Archive at that stage, about uh, 255, uh, 255,000 boreholes, um, and GRIP about 26, almost 27,000 boreholes. Um, and of course, a certain, certain percentage of that uh, GRIP data um, are, exists in the NGA as duplicates. So this is a summary that was also done during the course of 2019. Um, and you can see the breakdown between the different parameters, um, the borehole counts, uh, the number of boreholes that's got one or more water levels associated with it, the electrical conductivity, um, the list goes on up down to borehole logs. Uh, we quickly pick out this chemistry um, and when I refer to this chemistry I talk about the major anions and cations. Um, again we weren't able to get a snapshot of the, up to 2019. Um, we had no response from water affairs. So this number, the, that 12,000, um, is reflected uh, from the NGA 2008 data. So even though some of these numbers may look impressive, um, if we start looking, um, and this is only a spatial representation of it, if we start looking at the temporal data, um, and you look in a, a, a very narrow time window, um, you will find for your study area, you wouldn't have a lot of data simply because um, that particular borehole might, had, might have had one chemistry uh, sample taken in 1965 um, and the water level at the same time and it wasn't measured again. Okay, so just to give you a feel for the borehole distribution currently um, over the country, um, and so what we're looking at here, this is a combination of the GRIP 
um, and the National Groundwater Archive. And you'll see there's a, a few maps I'm going to show. Um, they use exactly the same scale. So if we look at the dark blue um, where we're starting, it's one to 10 boreholes in those little uh, squares. Um, and our maximum is between 1,000 and 1,250. Um, so that's our borehole distribution. If I scroll down, boreholes with water level data, boreholes with lith lithological data, boreholes with water strike data, boreholes with yield data, EC data, and then finally chemistry data. So we can clearly see um, from our spatial distribution that the, the data density thins out. And for the law, majority of our data sets, we've got um, the most of the data sitting up in the, in the Limpopo province. And, and this is due to the um, uh, GRIP project that um, was running there for, for a number of years. Okay, so what is our aim? What is our future scenario? Well, the first thing we'd like to do is, and what we've done is, um, we host all um, that borehole data in a cloud, in a, on a server over there. Um, we still will look in future, um, we've only put in a snapshot at the moment to see if new data entries um, uh, enters the NGA to update um, the specific database. Um, we'd also like to upload data back to the NGA um, and, and automate that if you like. Um, there is a concern though um, in terms of uh, uploading data from one database to another is um, the data verification. What is the data quality uh, of that specific data set? And I'm going to talk to you about that for in, a, in just a moment. And then, obviously, there needs to be some agreement um, if we were to connect these systems uh, to each other. So some of the questions uh, that pops up off the bat is, who will be the owner of the data? Um, currently, um, the National Groundwater Archive is um, administered through the Department of Water and Sanitation. Um, we're sitting here with a new database, which is essentially a snapshot of the NGA and that of GRIP, um, and the two data sets merged together. Um, and the data at this point in time resides under an academic license of the Northwest University. Once this project has matured um, and is up and running, obviously it needs to be moved out from under that academic license. And um, we have to look at a custodian uh, for this data then. So at this point in time, um, there's no answer yet, but the Northwest University will uh, maintain the project for as long as we can. Um, we've got issues of confidential data. Um, we deliberately did not add any functionality to accommodate confidential data. The reason being the idea behind this project is for data sharing. Um, and we have had some discussion over that in the past. I don't know, um, after the talk, if, if anyone of you want to uh, uh, come back to that, I'll be glad to um, explain um, some things that we've discussed. Um, the data verification uh, is difficult in the sense that, uh, obviously, if you give different users, and um, we're talking about citizen science, so we're gonna give ordinary users access to the system as well, um, we need to have some measure of control on the quality of data. So the easiest way for us to implement this is what you will see on, I suppose, most social media apps is the star rating. So first of all, we've got the group of professionals sitting here on the right hand side. So that's you guys, you are groundwater professionals. Um, and when you register um, on this app, uh, we will be glad to give you a five star rating because we know um, you are not, not going to be bored and just walk around and, and lock um, any type of data. You will see, I've shown, I'm showing a little phone over there. So this is our mobile app, but um, uh, there's also a accompanying desktop app that works in conjunction. The reason for this is um, you might have your own personal databases and you're prepared to share them. So you need to upload them. Obviously, um, the mobile app is more geared for single uh, borehole data capture um, type operations. And if you've got a large uh, volume of borehole information you want to upload, 
um, that will take place through a desktop app. So the desktop app is not something that will be available for the general public, um, and that's geared towards the groundwater professionals to make your life easier. The uh, citizen science on, uh, uh, concept, on the other hand, is we want to engage people um, uh, uh, of all walks of life, um, and they will register on this app, and we will start them off with a zero star rating or a one star rating, as shown in the image, um, and they will be allowed to log data. So that data will be uploaded to the, the cloud-based server, um, and the confidence in that data would obviously be low, so um, that refers to the one star rating as opposed to a five star rating from uh, a professional user. So there must be some incentive um, for the citizens to keep doing this. Um, so if they want to improve their star rating, the best way of, of doing that would be to keep logging more and more information. And the way that the rating propagates or increases over time is, if I've logged data as a one-star user and one of these five-star users or a three-star user uh, verifies that data um, uh, over a, a couple of, of, of data points, um, my star rating will, will increase. So eventually, if I'm, as a citizen, logging data and I've got uh, people doing a hydro census in the area and they validate that data, my star rating increase over time. So it's a difficult concept to try and do data verification apart from sitting and, and evaluating each um, and every data entry into the database. Um, and this was the, the main uh, motivation for, for using the star rating. So obviously, when you're querying data from your desktop application, you can um, decide what you want to see. Uh, all stars, only one stars, only five stars. So you can get an idea of the um, type of, of data confidence based on the uh, individual star ratings. Okay, so mobile GIS. Um, I think most of you are familiar with GIS. We use it in our work every day. Um, and mobile GIS just, is just a mobile com component of it. Um, so we host maps through servers um, that you can access on your phone. Um, some of the benefits of mobile GIS, it's uh, obviously improves the efficiency and accuracy of field operations. Um, it provides rapid data collection and seamless data in, uh, uh, integration. Um, the nice thing is it replaces paper-based workflows, and it helps you make timely and informed uh, timely and informed decisions. So um, when I'm out in the field with my phone, instead of uh, completing any um, all the data on, on a data sheet, for instance, I can log it immediately in, in the phone. Um, so it, it's quite handy. The, the other option that, or the other benefit that you have is you're sitting with a live map. Um, so if I'm standing at a specific point, um, I can zoom out, I can see um, other boreholes that's locked on the database in, in, in the vicinity. Um, I can route to them. Um, so it uh, actually uh, just, um, uh, um, enhances the way um, that we do uh, hydrosynthesis uh, when we compare it to our traditional approach, approaches. Okay, so I apologize for the, for the quality of this map. I couldn't find one that, that's high resolution, but um, it uh, shows the example network coverage. So over here, it shows from GPRS to HSPA coverage over the country. Um, and you can clearly see the darker areas uh, um, has got obviously better uh, um, mobile data coverage, where as we move to the lighter areas, um, we've got poor coverage. So this is something that we need to take cognizance of. If uh, we plan to have uh, data uploads and downloads in the field, we need to provide a mechanism if we don't have um, good enough uh, data coverage. And I'll talk to that problem a little bit later. Okay, so the development environment that we chose, um, so we had a workshop, um, there were some debates, should this development be um, uh, totally from, from the ground up? Uh, In-house development, are we gonna try and look at uh, off-the-shelf solutions? Um, we finally decided uh, 
to go with ArcGIS um, and they have got a development environment that's called App Studio, um, which makes use of the runtime SDK um, and we use the cube language to do the coding in. Um, initially, we thought we could use something like Collector or Survey123 for those of you that's familiar with those apps um, and build our app on top of that. Um, but there's certain functionality that's just not available in those apps. So um, we actually wrote the, the application for the most part uh, from scratch, um, trying to accommodate things like borehole locks. Um, we want to include user ratings um, in our system, uh, user credits, with it, which I'll talk about a little bit later and, and so forth. Um, and uh, the main reason for using choosing ArcGIS is that's the main, that's the core business is GIS. Um, so obviously we know they've got a mature platform in terms of uh, mobile development as well um, that connects straight to the uh, online servers. Okay, so um, looking at historic bore localities, so this is the, the predicament that we have. Um, and those of you that uh, query the NGA, um, for borehole data, we'll be familiar with this. Um, I'm just showing over here a map with some farm boundaries. Um, I've got a, a white cross in that uh, farm boundary over there. And that will be the position of the borehole that you will obtain from the NGA. Uh, but the actual position could be the one indicated in red, which is sitting more towards the side. So the reason for, for this uh, uh, and I want to put it in quotes, misplacement of boreholes was initially, um, if you look in going back into the 1960s, um, we didn't have the luxury of uh, GPS. Um, these days we, we carry GPS in our phones with us. Um, so the way that surveyors did it is they um, did a hydro census. Um, they took down the details of, of each and, and every borehole, but all those boreholes were assigned to the centroid of the farm boundary. So you'll have multiple boreholes. If you have multiple boreholes, they all uh, plot, well, almost uh, on the same coordinate. I'll show a, a zoomed version of it in a moment. Um, and this makes it difficult for us in this day and age when we query the NGA, we get all these uh, borehole localities, but when you go out into the field, chances are that you find them is, is quite slim. So there is a, a a problem for us to, to deal with. So if I zoom in, um, so this is an actual uh, arrangement of boreholes from the NGA, and you can typically see what they do. I've put a scale down here, so it's roughly about one meter. So all the boreholes are supposed to be assigned to that point, but because they don't want to cause duplicate uh, values in terms of coordinates in the system, they just arrange them, space them out uh, one by one meter. Uh, and you can clearly see this is very synthetic. Um, there's no way that you will find boreholes in a one meter spacing range like that in the field. So that's one of our challenges. Um, another thing that we can have a look at um, is to say we've got borehole elevation. So what I've done is I've just taken a, a sample of the NGA data um, on this axis at the bottom. I've plotted elevation. Um, in elevation mean, uh, mean meters above mean uh, sea level on the uh, y-axis the water level and you can clearly see where you've got uh, different water levels but at the same elevation those are nothing more than the 20 meter contours that was used um, again uh, we didn't have the detailed survey equipment in the past so when they plotted the borehole they looked up the elevation on a contour map and they assigned the closest 20 meter contour to it. Um, in this day and age, with um, the GIS and the digital elevation models that we've got, if we do have the correct uh, coordinate for that specific borehole, we can do a lookup um, on the digital elevation model and, and improve the situation as well in terms of, of data. Okay, so um, what happened in Cape Town? So I know there's some of the Cape Town colleagues um, on this uh, presentation and they might disagree with me. Um, the, the data when we started that we received from the WRC, they the sponsor of this project, estimated um, something to the tune of 30,000 boreholes drilled in the Cape Town area during the drought period. Um, these were all Schedule 1. 
Um, and as you know, Schedule 1 water use are generally low volume, low impact activities, um, and they do not uh, require a, re a registration with the government. Um, the question, though, is um, can we allow 30,000 boreholes in a small area? Um, I think that via, still violates the Schedule 1 uh, intended use. Um, so the concern we have is where are these 30,000 boreholes uh, located? Um, so, and this is part of the, the reason why we looked at citizen science. If, if boreholes were drilled and we had people at that time with a mobile app that could lock these borehole positions, um, it would certainly make our life easier as, as hydrogeologists when we do hydro censuses in the future because we know where they are, are located. So that, that would have saved a, a lot of time and money. Okay, so just uh, two slides on citizen science. So citizen science um, is we you use make use of uh, information from the general public. So you give them an app um, and they report whatever type of data. In this case, we are interested um, in asking them to assist us and to locate uh, different ball positions. And you can see on the timeline over here, this is just a, a website that keeps track of uh, um, citizen science, and it seems like from 2014 upward, there was a, a, a significant jump in the number of projects. Um, and this is partly due to the advancements in, in technology in our cell phones. Um, we're sitting with cell phones with, with an array of sensors these days. Uh, so depending on what type of data you want to, to gather, you can um, make use of those sensors. Um, so obviously, it, it gained some uh, popularity. Um, when we look at citizen science, the, the big question though is, um, will this project be uh, suitable? Um, will it be successful? Will, will people actually um, engage in assisting us to capture this data? Um, so we know that um, groundwater professionals will use the app, so it's not that it would be shelved, but ideally um, the initial uh, purpose of this project was to help us um, yeah, eradicate the, the problem on the on the locations. So this is just a table with six factors uh, that you normally uh, use to evaluate um, the suitability of your project uh, for citizen science. I'm just going to uh, look at the first one over here to say the clarity or aim of the question. Is it clear or is it very vague? So obviously moving from the bottom up, um, uh, it, the suitability of citizen, citizen science increases. So I'm just going to jump to the evaluation that we've done. Um, so for the most part, we got green smiley faces for our project. Um, the two that um, is a uh, yellow, so it's, it's, it's not a no-go, but the one is resources available. So the resources available over here refers to, um, we are not certain at the end of the day um, will be the, cons the custodians of this. Um, it's, a, it's a database system, so it's not something that, that just runs on its own. There's some maintenance that needs to be uh, done over time. So there is an admin component, um, and at this point in time, we haven't got resources or fixed resources allocated for it. Um, so we as the university will be doing it in the, in the meantime. So that's the one um, that we didn't get a, a smiley face for. And then the other one, which I suppose is a bit of a concern, um, is the motivation of participants. Um, so yes, as a groundwater professional, you guys might be very keen and interested to use this, um, but um, there's only a handful of us, um, and we want to engage the, the larger public uh, to do this. So uh, a borehole is not a very exciting thing. Um, when you look at it, it's not that we are doing a survey on different frog, frog types, for instance, um, and you need specialized equipment if you want to measure the water level or take a water sample. So it's not something the general public um, can uh, readily do. So at best, they'll be able to take a position for us, take a photo um, and, and have a few basic uh, drop down boxes that they can select from. Um, so that that's obviously one of the things that um, we, we need to work at to say, but how are we going to motivate the public to um, join us and actually using this this app. Okay, so science, citizen science success factors, um, these, there are six of them. 
So the first one is a clear goal. Um, so the goal in, in this particular instance was to determine ball localities, uh, regardless if other ball parameters can be measured by a specific user. Um, because if we know where the balls are, um, it makes our life easier in terms of the hydrosensors that, that we need to do. Engagement of citizens. Um, so we know that the engagement of hydrogeologists is a non-issue, able to keep the general public interested outside the realm of a water crisis. Um, that might be um, a, a, a bit of a challenge. Reliable data. Um, the best we can do in terms of reliable data is, is use our star system um, and that have, uh, professional users eventually come and, and validate those over time. Um, and, and we're also aware of the fact that, you know, a hydrosensors doesn't take place every month. Um, so there's, there's a long timeline that, that could be associated with this uh, data verification. Um, we know we'll end up with an improved database. Um, uh, in terms of contributing to science, um, the, the long-term idea behind this database is, is to start, if we get enough data, and start um, engaging um, things like data mining, a little bit of artificial intelligence to see what we can pull out of the, the data relations that we, we have. And in terms of, of communication, so um, we will uh, put this out to the wider public and there will be a training um, workshops that's run, um, that's funded by the Water Research Commission. Um, and this is not just for professional users, it's we actually invite the public, um, anyone that's interested to come for training and, and see how to um, use the specific um, app. All right, so let's get to the first case study. So this is prototype one. So this is just to give an idea, very basic, to see how it works. So um, this is done in the, the area of Potchefstroom. So the target audience here was just ordinary citizens living in Potchefstroom, um, university students. Uh, so obviously they didn't have much of a choice in participating. And then a local uh, environmental consultant that we've obtained some data from. So the database um, or the area that we looked at, we started off with the initial of 46 boreholes. Um, through citizens, um, we got 33 boreholes captured. Students uh, obtained another 19 um, and we obtained 11 from a consultant. So this wasn't done with the app itself. We just collected the data and it was uploaded in the, in the back end. Um, but to give you an idea, um, so you can see this is basically the area from the National Groundwater Archive. It looks like two boreholes over there, but if we zoom in on that one, you can clearly see that arrangement of the multiple boreholes assigned to a single uh, uh, centroid of farm, historic farm boundary. Um, and we know that they are, are non-existent. Um, after our hydro census uh, through the app, um, you can see the additional positions that, that uh, became available. So obviously, if we can get people to, to participate in using the app, um, there's a clear benefit um, in capturing uh, additional borehole positions. Um, and that's just a, a secondary screenshot of uh, what that specific uh, app looked like. Um, and you can see on the, the right hand side that um, you can uh, obviously capture the, the photo of the borehole. Um, the reason I've put this one in is you can see it's connected to a pump. So when a user gets to this point, um, uh, you might be able to select the purposes as for irrigation. It's equipped with a pump. It seems like it's in use. Um, obviously, in terms of taste of water, there's no access. Um, uh, and, and we get an idea. But other than that, um, there's not much more that you can actually measure at the, uh, the specific uh, site. All right, then we did prototype two, um, and this was called My Borehole. So that name has changed now um, since we are looking or we incorporated different site types. Um, we had a request to also include uh, rainfall stations. Um, and when we started with that, um, we had to ask ourselves the question uh, why shouldn't uh, we go um, redesign the data set rather? And keep it more generic because tomorrow someone wants to do uh, surface water assessments and they maybe want to measure stage at a, at a weir or whatever the case may be. Um, so the name has changed to Observisons. Um, but this gives you an idea and you'll see on the on the live app in a moment 
Um, when you look at the screen, um, that's not 250,000 boreholes. Um, the reason for uh, these few boreholes is um, we're only loading the first thousand or so to, to keep a, a reasonable speed on the app. When you start zooming in, you can see um, at, at every level, it will bring in more and more boreholes. Um, so this prototype, the idea is to keep it very simple. There's only a few categories over there that um, we looked at. So those are being extended at the moment. Um, but it gives you a, a fair idea of, of what we're looking at. Just a simple graph, port level, uh, bore lock at the, at the bottom. You can see the photo of, of, of the specific borehole. Um, I think the, the, the danger here is um, this is a mobile app and, and, and we want to try and, and uh, uh, pull as much information out of it as, as possible in the field, um, but one needs to be reasonable in terms of what you present on a mobile app. If you really want to do uh, serious data processing, that, that's something that, that um, we leave to your, your desktop. Okay, so just a, um, a quick uh, introduction to what three words. Um, I suppose a lot of you are already familiar with it. Those of you that are not familiar with it, um, so what this company had done is the whole earth is divided into a grid. So you can see over there, and that grid size is three by three meters. And each three by three meter cell or block has got a unique name. So it's not um, related to, to, the, to the coordinates. That whole cell over there will be identified in this case with rowdy.marvels.groom. Um, and uh, I see this has taken, um, uh, it's become quite popular. I see the latest car manufacturers use this in their um, navigation systems, um, emergency services. Uh, you can see the, uh, um, the purpose of it if you're standing in a big building um, trying to explain to someone at which entrance you are. If you send them the what three words, um, they can walk to you to up to a three by three meter block. So one of the questions or uh, um, challenges that we had with the um, uh, app is that we need to assign uh, um, a name, if you like, to that specific borehole. Yes, the phone will lock the latitude longitude coordinate, um, but when we communicate with each other, we um, don't use uh, numbers, especially not latitude and longitude. It's much easier um, using three words um, to explain to someone or give a, a, a coordinate. Um, systems like the NGA has got a naming convention and, and we're all familiar with it. Uh, but when we hand this over to users, um, pu the public, if you, uh, public users, uh, they will not, not all of them is gonna try and, and, and follow a naming convention. So we had to automate that. So we chose um, the what three word system. So at every point when you lock a coordinate or a ball position, it will automatically, um, uh, once it's uploaded to the server, look up the, the uh, what three words to the system. We did change it a little bit. We had to do a little refinement on it. So each block, and this is facing north, um, at the top of the screen, we subdivided that three by three meter block with uh, one by one meter squares so that we've got additional nine. So to that name, we will do a subdivision if we were sitting in the center square or let's say where this person is standing over there, that will be rowdy.marvels.groom.seven. So we know it's sitting in that um, one by one meter block. And the reason for this is that when you look at a three by three meter block, the chances are, are there that you can find two boreholes sitting in a three by three meter block, um, and then they will end up um, getting the same name. Uh, chances of getting a two boreholes side by side in a one by one meter block is, 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 is very slim. Um, and that's why we chose this naming convention. Okay, so the next steps where we are, um, uh, we will obviously start looking at doing training uh, once lockdown allows. Um, that's something you need to go out into the field because you need to stand next to a ball to be able to verify it. So it's not something that you can do over Zoom. Um, and then the, uh, we'll do the marketing of the app via plat 
different platforms. Um, the Groundwater Division would be a good one to start with in terms of uh, get, reaching out to our professionals, our groundwater professionals. Um, and then the, get, the app will be available on both Google and, and Apple stores. Um, but in, in our training sessions, um, we've got a, a app player that you can load to your phone. So um, it takes a while for, especially on the apps, Apple store, for them to, to validate and, and actually publish the, the final app. Um, so once they are on, on, on those two stores, the public will have access to it. Um, in the meantime, when we're doing training and, and you guys are interested, um, there's another way of getting it onto your phone and, and you can use it. Right, so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the Water Research Commission. So they funded the project. Um, and yes, we, we hope that um, our, we will reach our, our aim of, of actually engaging normal citizens and, and assisting us in capturing uh, war positions. All right, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to show you uh, just uh, some of the basic functionality of the, of the app. So it's called Observer. So if you just give me a moment, because now I need to uh, cast my phone screen um, onto the system. So you just give me one minute, then I think we'll be ready. Okay, so I hope you guys can, can see my, my phone screen. So you'll see this is what, what I'm having, holding up here in my hand. Um, so when, um, you, when you've logged into the app, you will see um, the ball distribution. Um, if I start zooming in and I'm gonna move to the uh, Limpopo province, we've got the, the grip data. Um, you will see the, you'll, um, there's a lot of boreholes um, that's just filled with gray. Then you see some of them that's got red and those in blue. So those in gray um, can either be from the GRIP database um, or the NGA, most likely the NGA. And the gray means it's a status that has not been verified. So we don't know at this point in time, is that borehole actually existing at that specific position? The ones in, in blue, if I zoom in a little bit, those are boreholes that has been verified by the, the GRIP project, so we know where they are. And the ones in red are non-existent. So if I start zooming in to the red, you'll see there's a good example over there. Um, these two boreholes in close proximity, one is blue and one is red. Um, so it's easy to see that that they were in all probability exactly the, the same borehole. Um, we're keeping the one in red for now, um, although in the system, in the background, um, we've got a function to merge them. So in future, if we are certain that they um, exactly the same boreholes, we will merge them and, and they will disappear. For now, we're keeping the display as is. Um, and the nice thing about this is um, you can have an idea idea of where people are working and, and if boreholes are actually being uh, verified or not. Okay, so some of the functionality um, on the map. So I can recenter and I can go to my position where I am. So if I zoom out a little bit, you can see Porchestrum Dam. 
So I am actually in Potchefstroom at this point in time. I can uh, change the, the base map. So this is our normal topo map. So I can go to settings. Uh, while we here, uh, you've got some functionality to change it into a dark mode or a light, a light mode, uh, depending on uh, what your liking is. So you can see the default there is the uh, topo map. If I choose street map and I go back, you will see my map is now updated with streets. Um, alternatively, I can also go and select the aerial imagery. If I go back, now you see the aerial imagery. Um, so you've got the uh, option of the three types of uh, base maps to use. Um, obviously, I can switch on my position or I can switch it off. Um, the reason why you would switch on your position is so that you can see where you are. When you create a new borehole, which I'm not going to do now um, because I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't have a borehole in the middle of my study, but typically, once you uh, have reached the position, you can hit the uh, top right-hand icon over there, and it's going to ask you, do you want to capture the site location? I'm going to say no. Um, when you capture it, it'll uh, uh, give you a few edit screens. So it's going to ask you, what type of site is it? Is it a rainfall station? Is it a borehole? So we're only supporting those two at this point in time, and future will, will probably support more. Um, if I want to look at borehole uh, information, um, let's just go to, I know this one over here, it's got a photo connected to it as well. So when I click um, on my screen, you can see it colors it in orange. It brings up the site type as a borehole. You can see the what three words for that specific location. Um, you'll see the old site ID um, that was obtained from the NGA. So the status of that ball is not verified. It hasn't got an elevation assigned to it, um, or a wrong elevation at least, because I see the elevation method there is um, estimated from a 1 in 50,000 map. Um, the elevation reference is, is, is also not assigned. Um, so when you add a specific borehole, um, you can get uh, then go and update the various information. Um, only when you, within a certain tolerance in terms of distance from the borehole, will it allow you to edit it. You can see over here, I can't edit anything. Um, and the reason for this is you don't want people sitting in their study and just uh, updating data um, all over the country. Um, we require a physical presence at that point to do the verification. Um, but you will also remember I have made mention of the fact of the desktop app. So the desktop app is there for the groundwater professionals. Um, and that app, you can obviously sit in your study and you can do bulk upload and do the verification if you already know a certain area, um, because there's no point in for you to go out and uh, capture each of those uh, by hand. I can click on photo at the bottom here. So, um, you can cap capture various photos. At this point in time, we allow up to, to six photos. So if different users uh, take different pictures, they can use that. And then you will see um, the list of, of, of data tabs. Um, so they're not active at this point in time. We're busy with the rebuild of the database. Um, but you can see the categories has extended. Um, and the reason for this is this is now aligned with that of the, of the NGA. Um, we are still looking at um, possibly employing certain or rolling out certain user profiles. So if you're a groundwater professional, you might want to see all of them. If you're just a normally uh, ordinary citizen, you might not be interested in, 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 in these. Um, so I think our final version will probably give you, a, a, in the settings, an option where you can tick the boxes that you actually want to see. Um, we need to look at, it becomes a, a huge volume of data. So we're optimizing the data structure a little bit for speed. But as you can see, um, if you have access to everything standing in the field, um, you'll be able to get quite a bit of information um, on that specific borehole. All right, so, and you can go and click on any borehole. Let's choose this blue one. Go back to my 
site information. Um, and you can see there on the status, it shows verified because it's got a blue color. If I click on its neighbor again, um, you will see it's not verified. Um, and you can continue um, working through the boreholes. Um, and of course, like I've mentioned, you can only capture the borehole if you're standing at that specific position or verify or change the state, edit its data um, when you're at that position. So you'll see at the top left hand, the RD is just my initials. So that's the user I am. Um, we also log, you create your company or the organization you work for. So I've entered the Center for Water Sciences, given myself a five star rating. And then there's one thing um, I haven't discussed. You'll see there's a number just below the star rating, and that's credits. So what we're aiming to do with this is every time you upload data, you will receive uh, a number of credits. So as an example, let's say for, um, for one uh, piece of information, um, you get 100 credits. And what happens with those credits is you consume credits when you download data. So this is um, to ensure that the app will only be used to share data um, for different people. So if you share the data, you will also have access to, to the data. So if you're never going to upload data, um, you will consume your initial credits and the system won't allow you to download any further. And the only reason why we do that is to try and motivate people to, to keep sharing data so that we can eventually um, have a, a broad database um, that's to the benefit of, of everyone. Um, maybe while I'm on the screen, you'll see um, there's an option that says offline maps. Um, so once you've zoomed to the extent uh, where you want to work, you can download the data for that specific area. I'm not going to do it now. Um, and it will actually cache it on your phone. So if you're in the field um, and you don't have a data connection, you can still uh, browse the maps, uh, click on the points, get all the data, add data. And as soon as you have a data connection, again, it will, it will actually um, upload to the, to the server. Um, I think that's basically the, the, the general gist of it, what I wanted to show you guys uh, this afternoon. Um, once we start doing the training, we'll go through the, the, the different processes and, and how it works. Um, and we're trying to keep it as simple as possible so that, that, that anyone that picks up the app um, uh, intuitive, in try, uh, intuitively know what to do with it. You know, we don't uh, foresee writing a, a very thick manual for it. Um, there'll obviously be some um, uh, more specific instructions on the on the desktop version. Okay, so oh, um, the other thing that I can just wanted to show you is in terms of the the what three words um, in our license, um, and, and the, this is a different credit than what I've just referred to. In our license, um, we receive a number of credits. But when we do things like routing, for instance, or geocoding on the server, um, on, it consumes ESRI credits, and, and those things cost money in the end. Um, so we're trying uh, to keep the app functionality as basic as possible so that we consume uh, the least amount of credits. So if I click on a, on a specific borehole over here, um, and the what three words is sings, hollows, blossomed. And I go to my what three words. Uh, it's also got a voice prompt. I can say sings, wallows, blossoms. Oh, sorry, I probably said something wrong there. With sings, hollows, blossomed. Sings, hollows, blossom. Um, you will see through the voice recognition, it picks up uh, um, some suggestions. I can click on the one that I've selected. I can hit navigate now um, and let's choose Google Maps. And it will route me. 
So we've got the functionality to put this routing into the app itself, but it consumes credits like I've mentioned. Um, and we've got a free app here that from what three words, um, so you can easily see uh, the benefit of actually using the, the what three words to, to get you to those positions and, and back. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, then we'd just like to thank everybody attending today's um, webinar. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, which we'll start um, advertising soon um, from the Northwest, uh, from the Northern Branch. Um, and have a great weekend. Bye.